Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to another show of At Home with Victoria. With your host, Victoria Gaither. And co-host, Michael K. everybody, and welcome to another edition of At Home with Victoria. I am Michael Kay, your entertainment co-host for tonight. The uh, lovely news lady, she's going to kick herself when she uh, knows what she's missing tonight, but uh, Victoria's in New York with her uh, with her second or significant other and uh, having a much-needed uh, rest and relaxation a uh, couple of days. So I want to say thanks to her, and uh, she's going to really kick it. Like I said, tonight we have with us... Uh, David L. Robb. Uh, David L. Robb's book, The Gumshoe and the Shrink, just went ahead and hit stores today. Uh, he'll be with us to go ahead and chat about that. And then a little later, we're going to listen to the Simmons Brothers, Nashville's own twins, uh, twin phenomenas, and they're here with uh, some of their newest music. So we've got a lot of fun, uh, a lot of fun topics. I want to thank everybody up in chat, Mar Ben and uh, Finnegan 2009, Catherine Taddy, Mike Cullip, my brother from another mother, and Sharon Connolly is up in chat. So I want to say thanks to everybody. But without any further ado, this man, like I said, uh, three-time Pulitzer Prize uh, nominee, uh, brilliant fellow, and uh, person that I think is going to be coming back and back to at Homeless Victoria, Mr. David L. Robb is with us tonight. David, how are you? Good, Michael. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Uh, so congratulations on the book hitting today. That's available on Amazon.com. And th- that hit stores as well today? Yeah, it's in all the bookstores that are left. Fantastic. Uh, let's go back a little bit to some of your uh, past. Um, you were UC, from UCLA, correct? Yeah. And uh, you've uh, worked freelance for the New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, Daily News, uh, Salon.com. Uh, how did you get uh, all started up in, in journalism? Well, I started in uh, journalism through a poker game. I was playing uh, cards with some professors, and I, one of the guys worked at the uh, the San Francisco Examiner said, hey, Ira, how do you get in the newspaper business? And he gave me a name to call, and I got a job as a copy boy back in the wow. 70s. And then I uh, ended up at the Hollywood Reporter for, and then Variety. I was each of those papers for 10 years each. Those are the Hollywood trade papers, and I covered the the unions and legal affairs. And so if you got a call for me, it was a bad day. <laughs> You must have uncovered so much dirt back then. Yeah, I, I, uh, it was I covered uh, Hollywood like uh, it was the docks, you know, the unions and uh, mm. gangsters, and uh, I covered. Uh, I was a document hunter. I was always looking for documents. I uncovered uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, federal grand jury testimony when the Justice Department suspected him of having taken a bribe from Lou Wasserman. Mm. At, Univer- at MCA, which later became Universal, mm-hmm. that gave uh, uh, Universal MCA the right to be a talent agent and also to produce TV shows. And they represented all the actors, and then they put them in their own TV shows. And this was a huge conflict of interest. Mm-hmm. And the, the Kennedy Justice Department finally made them break up, either be a talent agency or TV producer. And but Reagan's federal grand jury testimony, you can't get that from uh, a Freedom of Information Act request. They just don't give it to you, but somebody had slipped it to me. So mm-hmm. we had a big story about how he was suspected of having taken a bribe. And they, and this was right during the, his uh, second, his re-election campaign. So it was, a, it was a big story. I love documents, and that's how this book started. Yeah. Uh, the um, Gun and the Shrink was... Uh, it's about uh, the 1960 uh, Kennedy-Nixon election. It's a true detective story. It's about a detective who uncovered Nixon's big secret that he was seeing a shrink. Right. And that was based on the uh, the notes from Donald, uh, Dr. Arnold Hutschnecker. Well, Dr. Dr. Hutschnecker was uh, Nixon's uh, uh, sure. psychotherapist. Oh, okay. And uh, some in, in 1960... In, in July, Kennedy was nominated in Los Angeles for the Democratic Party uh, presidential candidate. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but a month earlier, somebody had broken into his doctor's offices in New York, his endocrinologist and his pain doctor, and they turned the place upside down. Filing cabinets were open, files on the floor. Somebody was looking for JFK's medical records because Kennedy always denied it, but he actually had a thing called Addison's disease, which is a disease of the adrenal glands that affects the uh, hormones, the metabolism. It's why he was always getting so sick. Hmm. If they could prove this and somehow slip it to a reporter who wasn't so picky about where he got his material, this could have knocked Kennedy out of the race. Mm-hmm. So Kennedy's father, Joseph P. Kennedy, one of the richest men in the country, former ambassador to Great Britain, re- knew that they had to get something on Nixon. So he threw, he got Frank Sinatra to hire uh, a detective, and the detective was named Gunther Reinhardt, who found out that Nixon was seeing the shrink. And I I got his uh, report on his surveillance of Nixon, and then I uh, got uh, Dr. Hunsnaker's unpublished manuscript about his treatment of Nixon. So all that's in the book. Hmm. Is it true that uh, people in Nixon's camp wanted him to become more like, uh, um, what's his face, uh, his running mate? Spiro Agnew? Oh, uh, in, not, uh, in '60, it was uh, it was a uh, Henry Cabot Lodge. Right. Now he was Lodge was a was a, a liberal Republican, which they still had in those days. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's going by the wayside. Well, with all of your wealth of experience, now what do you what do you see in the current administration? How, how are you how are you um, reading between the lines through a lot of the stuff uh, that's been put out uh, on television and stuff? Basically, right now, I, I get most of my information on the web. I, I, I can't I can't watch news television when it comes to politics. I never know what the hell I'm looking at. But how do you see the climate right now versus the '60s? Well, in the '60s, there were still moderate Republicans. They, they had one on the ticket. Today, they're, they've been all uh, run out of the party. It's it's just uh, it's become the Republican Party has basically gone off a cliff. I think mm-hmm. for the last four years, President Obama has been trying through compromise and negotiations to bring the Republican Party back to the middle a bit because he knows that if one party goes off the cliff, you the country is in big trouble so he's been Mm -hmm. trying to bring them back but that hasn't worked they've just they've gone off the cliff and now i think they're gonna they're gonna definitely lose the presidency there's no doubt about that really and uh they are gonna the democrats are gonna keep the senate and they might even win back the house it depends Mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I don't know. I don't. Um, there's between Gingrich and uh, uh, Santorum and uh, the other little freak, Ron Paul. Yeah, it's uh, um, dumb and dumber. Yeah, I really don't know. I mean, even if you want to attach a, a non judgmental mind in, in what and how they're saying things, just the absolute level of intelligence frightens me. And I don't think anybody really. I, I, would you actually want to be president of, of a country? I mean, I don't know who the hell would even want that responsibility. Well, you have to have quite an ego to want that job, and yeah. to think and and to think that you are the best person in the country to do it is uh, it takes a <laughs> huge ego, pretty 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 huge ego, and you know um, a lot of them seem to have it. Let's go to I'm going to go to your first book, The Operation Hollywood, how the Pentagon shapes and censors the movies. I found the, the premise of that quite interesting, but uh, w- how did you find how how did how did how does the Pentagon help shape the movies? Well, when I was at the trade papers at Variety and the Hollywood Reporter, I'd always heard that uh, and occasionally there'd be a little story about some uh, movie producer who was, uh, uh, got approval from the Pentagon to use their equipment, their planes and ships and submarines and personnel and military bases at virtually no cost to help them produce a picture. So I was wondering if there were – I always wondered if there were any – documents on this since i like documents so much Mm -hmm. so i started looking around and i found thousands of pages of documents that the pentagon had donated to georgetown university library special collections department all the people over the last 50 years that had 
requested Pentagon assistance on their pictures, and then they would, once you ask for their assistance, they look at you, you have to give them the script, and if there's anything in the script that's negative about the military, they write you notes and say you got to take out this and you got to take out that to make it more military friendly so that people, when they see it, will want to join up and sign up with the Army or the Navy or the Air Force. Mm-hmm. So I found these documents, and they were just jaw-dropping. I mean, the, the Pentagon's heavy hand in the production of movies, I think, is is something that most people don't know anything about. So it's it's hundreds of films have gone through this process. And some you can still make pictures without getting their approval. You just don't get to use their stuff, so it costs a lot more money. You have to go to the Philippines and rent their planes and stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's really the the heavy hand of the military and and uh, uh, entertainment fair that that is really unconstitutional because the the Supreme Court has ruled that the First Amendment means that the government cannot favor speech that it likes mm-hmm. and not give the same benefits to speech that it doesn't like. They can't give a tax break to somebody if they write a nice column about the president. Mm-hmm. So, but that's what the military does. If you play ball with them. They'll let you use their stuff, but if you won't play ball, they won't let you use their stuff. A yeah. lot of films have never been made because they just, they couldn't do it without the military assistance. Yeah, so it's a I real mean, type of government censorship. Yeah, like a military sanit- sanit- sanitation. Uh, Catherine Teddy from LA is, is mentioning, which is a really good idea. But I, I think that's been I think sanitization has been throughout. I, I don't I don't think. The average American public is getting the true story of what's going on. I think uh, that we're fed information that we can handle. I think if we really understood what level, I think I would have loved to have been there uh, when Barack had gotten in, into into office and was signing the papers, and then the very next day when he went to work, he got that the big book of how screwed up absolutely everything is. And the look on his face, I think, would have been priceless. But um, I think that that has been (laughs) – I I encourage – do you ever get to the point where you're frightened to uncover some of the stuff you you discover? No, no. I I like to – the more I can find out, the better. I I love uh, secrets. And uh, you just – it's. I think what you discover is that people are people, and that uh, there are secrets. But in the end, uh, you know, twenty, thirty years later, they don't matter anymore. Now, twenty or thirty years from now, people are going to be finding out what's going on today. It's going to take that long before we really find out everything that's happening now. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, a lot of the secrets are are just bureaucratic CYA. You know what that means? Cover your. Right. Cover your ass. <laughs> yeah, and so it's yeah. a lot of the secrets. They just stamp everything secret. It's not that big a secret. A lot of it is, uh, it's like a lot of these files that came out on Wik- uh, WikiLeak. Yeah, right. They did not paint the American government in that bad a picture. It, 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 it. They were mostly cables and and messages saying how all of our ambassadors saying how messed up all these other countries are. It embarrassed us that. Our true feelings came out about some of these countries, but it helped spark the 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 so called Arab Spring. Mm-hmm. And who knows how that's gonna turn out, but information is good. Light is good. It it helps. It's uh the truth is not scary. The truth is uh it's good to be enlightened and it's it's good to be disillusioned, to get rid of illusions. Yes. No, I, I I agree, and and that's that's I think up to the discretion of of the viewers with the, with the internet. Now there's so many sources of information that you have to really find a new source that you end up trusting in the long haul because there's so much, forgive the language, there's so much bullshit out there. Some people don't even know what to believe. Well, there's a great site called Snopes, S N O P E S dot com, mm-hmm. that people can go to, and it and it checks out all kinds of rumors. And that get passed along on the internet, and it's very reliable as to what's really true and what's not true. It's a great site. Right. Recommend it to everybody. Absolutely, uh, David. We have an active chat tonight, and I uh, have a question actually. I think coming from uh, Taddy or coming back from Finnegan, 2009. Uh, would like to know: Does the Pentagon concern itself with any political slant of movies? No, it's not. It's not political, although. There was a time in the in the fifties during the Cold War when it was it was it was uh, if somebody 
they made John Wayne take a movie, a, a line out of one of his movies because somebody uh, uh, had uh, uh, said something bad about the government of Taiwan. They made mm-hmm. him take that out because they were our allies. And every once in a while there will be something like that. But mostly what the military wants is just positive portrayal of the military so that people mm-hmm. see the picture and think, oh, that's a good thing. I'm going to join that. It's not so yeah. political as it is definitely uh, advancing military recruitment and retention of personnel because the military goes personnel go to see the movies and they say oh we're heroes and they they want to stay in mm-hmm. and it also helps for their funding and and that senators and congressmen and presidents go see movies too and when they see positive portrayals of the of the military which have been you know underwritten by the military they're more likely to uh, want to keep funding the military mm-hmm. but as far as a, a political point of view nowadays that's they don't lean republican or democrat or liberal conservative Hmm. another question from california has your life ever been threatened by the stuff you've uncovered uh no and uh a friend of mine was uh deeply involved uh, got in uh my my old editor in fact uh, got involved in the whole anthony pelicano uh, thing in which uh, a big shot in Hollywood hired a private detective to uh, destroy her, and they put a bomb threat on her car, and the police were involved, and the FBI, and there was a huge trial, and all kinds of people went to prison. Very few reporters are uh, are killed in in America. Don Bowles was killed down in Arizona. Uh, but basically, they don't kill reporters here because basically the really bad guys know that reporters don't really ever uncover crimes. What they what, Good reporters basically just get crumbs from the detectives or police or the FBI, and they're following the trail of, of the law enforcement agency's investigations. Very few reporters actually solve crimes. So there's really no reason to threaten reporters. Well, yes, true that, but uh, you and know. they're trying. The reporters are not in the bag. I've known a lot of reporters, and I don't. I mean, there are some bad reporters. I had to leave the Hollywood Reporter when I re- found out for the second time that one of my colleagues was taking bribes. Really? And uh, they 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 wouldn't run it, so I left the paper. There are some definitely bad reporters. Yeah. But I personally don't know any reporters that are in the bag for the government or the FBI or for anybody that are just, you know, stooges. Yeah. Reporters generally are trying to, to to tell the truth. Well, true, true that. Um, you, you know, this reminds me a little bit of a book that I read a few years ago, well, 10 years ago, so kind of uh, thing by Julia Phillips, uh, You'll Never Eat Lunch in This Town yeah, yeah. Again. Um Brilliant read, but boy, did she ever screw herself in Hollywood. Well, Hollywood doesn't like troublemakers, you know. Uh, yeah. In Hollywood, people get blacklisted all the time. There's the famous writers who are all blacklisted because they had been or suspected of being communists. And uh, myself, I'm bl- basically blacklisted in both papers because cause I exposed uh, one of my colleagues for taking bribes, and uh, at Variety I was blacklisted because when I left there to go to the Hollywood Reporter, I wrote about what a crook that the editor was there. The editor was actually a mobbed-up guy who who, uh, used the paper to to help his friends and hurt his enemies. It 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 was a former production executive who took over one of the great Hollywood trade papers, Daily Variety. He's finally retired. But before that, Variety had been run by this family, and it was a great paper. Yeah. Great family, great news company. They didn't care about if it hurt advertisers. They just – they were a, a great paper. And then this new guy ran it into the ground. It was really yeah. shameful. Yeah, no, But blacklisting is very real in Hollywood. If you make oh, trouble, absolutely. They don't like yeah. it. Absolutely. I was uh, prior to my uh, radio little career here. I was a hairdresser, and believe me, hairdressers get blacklisted. I think everybody and uh, everybody in their own chosen profession have a list where you can totally screw, screw yourself out of uh, being popular. But yeah. between government and Hollywood, what what is your what is your most interest to cover? Well, 
I I like uh, I like them both. I really like I, I like covering uh, government. The, the American government is the is uh, I think the best government in the world. Mm-hmm. But it's got all kinds of secrets, and I like to find out secrets. And Hollywood is really the the cultural center of the whole world. We have dominated the world not so much through our military, but through our culture. Our culture Mm -hmm. has taken over the world. The Roman Empire couldn't even do what we've done culturally. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Hollywood and and government are really, they're they're separate, but they often uh, come together, and there's a lot of connections. And between those two things, well, the, the military, the government, and Hollywood pretty much sums up everything. And I, I I like uh, I like them all because they've all got secrets and uh, they've all got fascinating people who uh, run in those circles. Yeah. Um, another question from Chat uh, Taddy from California. How powerful do you think is Hollywood in putting candidates into office? I don't think that's really. Uh, I don't think it's up to Hollywood. Well, I think that Obama probably owes a good portion of his election not so much to Hollywood, but to guys like Keith Oberman and uh, John Stewart and mm-hmm. David Letterman, who were ridiculing uh, McCain and Palin every night, ridicule is the worst thing that can happen to a candidate. Mm-hmm. And they were ridiculing and ridiculing. It was so true and so funny. I really think that uh, that they might have tipped the the scales, and not yeah. just those, but as those are examples of the media sort of weighing in, and and Bill Maher also on the Politically Incorrect, just basically making a fool of the other guy. Mm-hmm. And that can be very damaging. I don't think they really ever recovered from from the ridicule that they got. So, Well, well no, there was just so much material, though. I mean, Palin alone, when, when um, uh, Tina Fey took over the imitation and basically just recited some of the things she said verbatim, yeah. Tina Fey, and it became yeah, just like, oh, heaven. It yeah. destroyed her, and I think it really helped Obama huge. When yeah. a person has become a laughingstock, it's very hard for people to vote for him. Mm-hmm. There's nothing <laughs> more powerful than than uh, humor, and nothing more hurtful than to become uh, the town fool. Yeah. What do you did you happen to catch the, uh, Sarah Palin's little show where they follow her around in Alaska? Yeah, it was ridiculous. Yeah, I couldn't see the purpose of it. I don't know. Well, it was he, just you know, it was just uh, promoting her as a. As a you know, a soccer mom and a outdoors woman, and you know, and a brand. lunatic. Yeah. It's, well, a, see, that's just it. Everybody's got a brand nowadays. The, the more I hear about it, the be, be true to your brand. Yeah. It makes me laugh, but it, it, it's a, it's a viable. Um, it's well, a viable brand product used term. to be a bad word. It's something they did to cattle. Right. Now it's you know. <laughs> now it's well, like a good thing. Metaphorically, absolutely. I'm um, going to go back to the chat room and everything. Um, where are we here? Someone's just there's so much chat in the chat room, anyways. But um, so let's go back to the Gumshoe and the Shrink. It's available in every bookstore, Barnes and Noble, um, Amazon.com. Uh, are, are you on? Are you on social media? I tried to look you up on Facebook, and I don't notice you there. Yeah, yeah, I got a Facebook thing. My wife does that for me. Okay. Do you want to go ahead and share that with the audience? How can people keep in touch with you? Uh, just uh, I have an email, davidrob88 at aol.com, and uh, there's a Facebook, David Rob. I don't know. You know, I don't even have a cell phone. So <laughs> I can type really fast. Yeah. And uh, I'm good looking up stuff on the computer and finding secret documents, but the tech... I, the technology, I sort of missed a, I skipped a step or something. Once you miss one beat, bam, it's past you. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Facebook, I, I thought it was, I, I really did use it more or less just keeping up with relatives. And now it's, you know, 98% of my business. Right? I, I find it just so, um, so fascinating. Let's talk about Pulitzer. Um, nominated for three. Nominated in uh, 1994, 96, and 98. Yeah, I was at the Hollywood Reporter, and I was doing a whole bunch of work on uh, on uh, the uh, 
the blacklist, the Hollywood blacklist, uh, back in the 40s and 50s, uh, the House Un-American Activities Committee, on which Richard Nixon sat as a congressman, was was uh, looking into everybody's politics, and if you wouldn't answer their questions, Hollywood would blacklist you. You'd be you'd be mm-hmm. banned from working. So all these writers, directors, actors got blacklisted. But I was focusing on a lot of the writers continued writing under fake names or under using uh, fronts. And so mm-hmm. I w- set about finding out all the movies that were written by these people under different names and who the real writers were on these. So I wrote a bunch of stories. And and my uh, pub- my publisher at the Hollywood Reporter really loved those stories, and so they nominated me a bunch of times for over the years for that and, and for my coverage of uh, the unions and coverage of uh, uh, minority issues in Hollywood, mm-hmm. African Americans, Hispanics, uh, American Indians. I was basically the complaints department. If somebody had a complaint, they'd send them to me. <laughs> and you actually won the uh, NAACP Image Award for journalism in '90. Yeah, I got an Image Award for covering uh, their issues, which are fascinating. Uh, Merle Evers, who was the uh, the the executive director of the NAACP for a while, she was out here for the Image Awards one year, and that's the awards they give to Hollywood for positive images of African Americans. And I asked her, well, how have things changed? This is in the 90s, early 90s. I asked her, how? And she was the wife of Medgar Evers. The wi- she was the widow of Medgar Evers, a great civil rights leader who had been oh, assassinated okay. in Mississippi. And she told me, well, things have changed a lot. Uh, when she and Medgar were in Mississippi, they would watch the Ed Sullivan show. And Ed had a variety show on CBS, and he was a kind of a progressive guy. He would have black acts on his show, Lena Horn and... Uh, not King Cole. And in Mississippi, whenever a black act would come on his show, the CBS affiliate there would go to dead air. Really? Just the hissing. <laughs> and that was it. And then when they were done, back with the guy juggling or some slapstick comedian. And nobody even reported about it. That's just the way it was. In 1961, when Obama was parents were married... He couldn't have, they couldn't have gotten married in 17 states in the South because marriage mm-hmm. between black and white was illegal. Really? So things have changed a lot, and that's that's one thing I always try to encourage people to recognize is that things really have gotten better in so many ways. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that blacks and whites couldn't get married, and now, and now the debate is whether gay people can get married. But it's happening much faster. It took 100 years for blacks to get married mm-hmm. after the Civil War to mm-hmm. a white person or a white uh, and now gay marriage is legal in I don't know five or six states or more yeah, yeah it just became legal here in Delaware actually in January yeah. and uh, yeah, it's, so it's, it's amazing it's I, I really weird. honest to God never thought that I would have actually lived to see that day but I live I in knew California it was kind of cutting California edge, turned it down Proposition 8 They've been flip flopping for the last few years, so on that. It's I like, know they put in a Schwarzenegger. This is the bluest state in the country, and they keep. Mm-hmm. I don't know. They're fooled by Hollywood sometimes. Ronald Reagan was out of here. They they started him too. California. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna go back to the chat for one last question from Finnegan 2009. What do you think of uh, Michael Moore? Well, Michael Moore is a uh, is a fantastic provocateur. He really raises the questions. I was not happy with uh, Bowling for Columbine because I had known uh, Charlton Heston for many years. He was a former Screen Actors Guild president. He was always uh, in the mix in in SAG politics, and I knew him quite well. One time I was on vacation in Alaska, and he called me up there. He was a great guy, nice guy, very accessible. And in Bowling for Columbine, Roger Moore showed up at his house, let him in, and then he accused him of killing all those kids at Columbine because of his support for NRA. Well, I thought it was mm-hmm. a cheap shot. Yeah. Other than that, I really like, you know, Michael Moore's thing is sort of the cheap shot, but when it happens to somebody that you know, you feel differently about it. Yeah, it hits, it hits a different level. Yeah. But otherwise, I, his uh, capitalism movie, is the, the movie he did about uh, uh, healthcare. healthcare 
uh, Roger and me, they're great and provocative and thoughtful and clever pictures. Yeah. And I, I think he's a he's a he's a real uh he's really out there always giving it to him. Yeah. Which is what every everybody needs to do is uh, like I said be disillusioned yeah. like you said be disillusioned because it's the only way we're going to actually get our heads out of our ass. But uh, David, yeah. we're we're out of time, my friend. You're listening to David L. Robb, his new book, The Gumshoe and the Shrink, hit stores today. Uh, you can also go ahead and um, find it on Amazon.com forward slash David L. Robb. David, you're a fascinating man. I can't thank you enough for taking the time tonight. Well, Michael, I sure appreciate it. You asked some really good questions too. So thanks a million. Well, thanks, buddy. I really Say hi to appreciate Victoria it. for me. I certainly will, and I have to go ahead and do this uh, technically. I have to say, anytime you know you're you're at home with Victoria is always waiting for you. So, buddy, I thank you so much for for joining us tonight. All right, thank you. Take care. Bye. That was David L. Robb, author, The Gumshoe and the Shrink. Like I said, available uh, in uh, pretty much every bookstore now. Uh, fantastic and fascinating guy, and uh, we've got to have him.